let's say you sit down to write some code in a read eval print loop or a REPL. In this competitive programming task, we want to take a number like 420 and turn it into an array of substrings of the printed number. So 4, 42, 420. And you're happily typing along, trying this statement, and then changing it a little into that statement until you get a little stuck. You can think about it a lot, or you can use program synthesis to get the program you wanted. But synthesizers need to be given a specification in order to search for a program. And while we do have examples as part of our task, that's not exactly what we want. Some of this expression is right, and our examples only cover the end-to-end -end behavior of the entire program. We want to be able to do something a little more complicated than that. Our previous work, the granular interaction model, gave users more power when they specify, or more often re-specify, a synthesis task by also giving the synthesizer syntactic clues about the program. This bit is good, this bit I don't know. So with a few more features, this form of specification became the basis of our read eval synth loop, or wrestle. Let's see how that would play out. In wrestle, you start off by assigning values to the variable input, just like you did in the REPL but you also provide outputs for those inputs. Those are handy to check yourself, but will also become part of the specification for the synthesizer if you want to use synthesis. So 420 should return 4, 42, 420. And unlike in a REPL, you can add more than one input valuation to wrestle. The competitive programming task has two examples in it, so no harm in inputting both. Each program, starting with the default initial program input, is evaluated on all the valuations and compared to their outputs. They don't match, so they're shown in red. You now try writing the program, just like you did in the REPL, and get the results of that program for both inputs. But more than that, you can click on any sub-expression and see its values each time it's executed. You get its evaluation for every input you gave wrestle, and since this case is inside of a loop, every loop iteration will show up here too. So now that you have a better idea what was wrong, and off by one error, you test your fix for the first and last element of the range you'd like to be using. 1 and 3 for the first input, 1 and 4 for the second. Looks good. But now you're still stuck. How do you create this range of numbers in JavaScript? So it's time to turn to synthesis. You actually verify that the map does what you want, and it's only the range that needs fixing. So you mark it as the code to be fixed. This creates a sketch of the code in purple, with a hole where the code in white is. Sketching is the paradigm in synthesis where the skeleton of the solution is known and all the synthesizer has to do is complete it. And since your examples are all examples for the full behavior of the program, they're going to be bound to the sketch for the purpose of synthesis. You also know that you want the number of digits of the input to be part of the resulting program, so you tell Russell to retain this part. All of these together make up our specification for synthesis. Retain and the sketch bound examples make up predicates on programs that the synthesizer will consider. Each of these is a logical predicate that returns true for a subset of the synthesizer space. For instance, returns true for all programs that for 420 return for 42, 420. In a world of specification predicates, we can come up with all forms of specification like the type constraints right below here. And with this set of predicates as the specification, Russell will now synthesize a completion to the sketch. In just a few seconds, Russell synthesizes this completion, which is assigned back into the sketch where the old incorrect code used to be. You can see that it does just what you wanted, creating ranges one through three and one through four. And your entire code is now correct. In the remainder of this talk, I'm going to show you what technical improvements we had to make to the synthesizer to support both predicates and sketching, and then tell you about the Russell user study. Now let's unpack what's going on here technically. When we do bottom-up enumerative synthesis, we make new programs out of smaller programs by using programs we've already seen as the child nodes for the new programs. We chose this method specifically for a bunch of reasons that are detailed in the paper. 
To counter the inherent exponential blow up in this method of search, we prune the search space using a technique called observational equivalence. We define two programs to be observationally equivalent if they behave the same for every input that we care about, which in our case are inputs from the example. So for instance, if our example's input says x is zero and y is one, then the expression x is observationally equivalent to the constant zero because they evaluate to the same thing on the input. And one, y, y plus zero and x plus y are all observationally equivalent as well. If we keep just one program as the representative of each equivalence class, then that's a lot of programs we're getting rid of and fewer programs we'll be using to make larger programs from. However, if we now add another example where let's say x is one and y is one, this refines our equivalence relation by adding another output and makes x no longer equivalent to zero and x plus y no longer equivalent to y and y plus zero. So refining our equivalence relation means we'll see more programs. So let's say we wanna use a synthesizer to sort an array of strings by their last character. The specification we get from the user has the following. An example of the list before and after sorting. A sketch that specifies that we're synthesizing the body of the compare function inside of sort, which takes A and B as its arguments, and the requirement to retain A at A dot length minus one, which gets us the last character of A. Let's see what happens if we wanna do synthesis with observational equivalence here. We're going to assume for the moment that we have values for A and B to work with when we enumerate, which are all values from the input list. We're going to circle back to where those values came from in just a moment. Oh, let's say we enumerated the expression two, which evaluates on every input to two for every valuation that we have. Then sometime later, we enumerate the program a dot length. Now I didn't tell you where the value for a came from, but since all of the strings in the array are length three, that's going to be three for all of them. And then when we get to a dot length minus one, that's gonna be two for all of them, which means we're going to get rid of a dot length minus one. Which means now, even if we find code that sorts the list, it won't retain a at a dot length minus one, because we construct larger programs from their smaller pieces and we just got rid of an essential piece. To fix this, we generalize observational equivalence to now define two programs as equivalent if for every predicate in the specification, the result of that predicate's observer is the same for both programs. What's an observer? It's a function that represents that predicate for the purpose of an equivalence reduction. If our predicate is an input-output example, its observer evaluates the input just like before. And for retain, what we wanna do is to make sure we don't lose any sub-expression of the retained expression. So we name each of the sub-expressions with one as the root and retain's observer will be one if the full retained expression appears in the expression. The ID of the sub-expression if it is that sub-expression and zero otherwise. So for a dot length minus one, the retained component will give us three, whereas two will get zero. And as a bonus, not only is a dot length minus one now differentiated from two, it's also differentiated from b dot length minus one, which would have been observationally equivalent under examples, since any string from b also comes from our input list, where all the strings are of length three, which is good because we need both of them for our target program. I said we would circle back to how we get values for a and b, since they're new variables local to the sketch and we don't have inputs for them in our examples. To take care of that, we have to extend our input valuation into a valuation that has the internal variables. But more than that, we have to make sure that we have all possible values for a and b, because without them, observational equivalence won't have enough values with which to be discerning enough and the correctness of observational equivalence won't hold. We expand on this in the paper. So what are all the possible values? If our sketch was for map or filter, we could look at one valuation per element in the list. 
but the comparator in sort is applied to pairs of elements while the sort algorithm is running and depends on the implementation of sort that it's being used in. The worst case is that every pair of elements in the list will be compared. That means that we have to consider extended valuations with every pair of elements. And what happens if our sketch is inside a reduce or fold or accumulate? We explain in the paper why we believe it's impossible to find an extension for reduce that won't cause observational equivalence to lose programs. So like many synthesizers before it, Russell has to stop optimizing when inside a reduce. On top of doing an empirical evaluation for our technical contributions, we also did a user study within subjects on 19 participants, all experienced industry programmers, but who had never used JavaScript before, who used RESL, a JavaScript synthesizer, or a regular REPL, in addition to documentation, to solve four competitive programming tasks in JavaScript, two in each tool. Two of our research questions for the study, there are more in the paper, are, does Russell reduce the editing load for the programmer? We measured this with the number of program attempts the user made, including programs with errors and programs that don't even parse correctly. And in tasks performed with Russell, how much of the final program was written by the synthesizer? And does Russell reduce programmer frustration? Which we looked at by seeing how many users quit the task without completing it in each of the tools. In three out of four tasks, synthesis meant a big reduction in iterations where the user entered a program, replaced by calls to the synthesizer. In the fourth task, synthesis was not that helpful, so a median of zero synthesis calls in completing the task also meant not so much difference in the number of edits. And in two out of the four tasks, Russell's synthesizer took care of more than half of the code, so it did pretty well in reducing the editing load. As for abandoning the task, no Russell user gave up, while some REPL users did. And interestingly, users who used REPL after they used Russell did not give up. So it looks like this reduction of frustration might have longer lasting effects. So to conclude, I showed you the read eval synth loop, synthesis embedded into a REPL. I talked about the technical challenges to allow general predicates like retain and type constraints to be part of the specifications, and the challenges to synthesize inside of a sketch. And finally, I showed you some of the results of our user study that showed Russell helped with both frustration and reducing the amount of editing that users had to do.